I want to live to be 200 years old. You know, and how I do that is by uh, people remembering who I was. Hey, thanks for tuning in, stopping by, whatever you want to call it. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 260. Today, we're joined by our guest, Shihana Ryan Chamberlain. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks for joining me as I get the opportunity to talk to someone I've known for quite a long time, actually. But there are always more stories to tell, and a good part of what we talk about today is stuff I never knew. So that's awesome. A lot of fun for me, and you get to come along for the ride. If you don't know who I am, I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder of Whistlekick's Barring Gear and Apparel, and you can check out the awesome stuff we make at whistlekick.com. You can also find the rest of our podcast episodes and the show notes for this and the other episodes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. There are links from both sites to sign up for our newsletter. You can check out a ton of really sweet stuff that we put out beyond the podcast, beyond the products. We're just here trying to make the martial arts better, trying to give you more opportunities to connect with each other, to expand your learning, and really just to enjoy being a martial artist, even when you're not training. Our guest today started training during a time when martial arts was really popular. The Karate Kid and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were in movie theaters and on TV, and Sheon Ryan Chamberlain wanted to be in the martial arts, but his parents weren't so keen on that idea. So he trained secretly, just so his parents wouldn't be upset. Now today, his parents know that he trains, and so do many, many other people, because he's an active instructor and a school owner, and he practices a number of different martial arts systems. So let's hear his story. Sheon Chamberlain, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here after a, a stormy uh, day yesterday. I could sit down and talk to someone about martial arts versus shoveling snow. <laughs> hey, you know, always happy to give you that opportunity, that break. I wonder if we have any folks out there listening to this right now that are removing snow. That might That would be... That'd be kind of meta. That'd be fun. Yeah. I'm going to imagine, I'm imagining someone out there shoveling and now they're laughing <laughs> as they're shoveling. It's a nice relaxing thing to be able to listen to while you're beating snow bangs back. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, that's absolutely the case. And we're, we're getting kind of, I don't know if, I don't know if I want to say we're getting hammered, but this, this could be a snowy winter for us up in New England. I don't know. Absolutely. I mean, what, five snowstorms by, uh, by Christmas. That's, uh, yeah. it's quite a few. Um, uh, that's right. I think I might have to do a hiatus down south to train. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't blame you. It's always a, a great opportunity, a great excuse, right? Was, well, you know, it's snowy and it's cold, but I've got to go to this seminar in Florida. <laughs> yeah, thankfully I get friends in a lot of warm places. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. We both do. We're, we've both been pretty lucky with all the folks that we've met. Of course, you know, you and I go back quite a ways and I'm, you know, we'll we'll give the listeners a, a little bit of that as we thread through. We talk about some of these questions. But of course, the best place to start is the beginning. So how did you start in the martial arts? Wow, that's a, that's a story. It's pretty interesting. Um, uh, I started in 1986 um, with a gentleman by the name of David Bicknell uh, back in the day. Uh, he was a Valari offshoot. Um, it was kind of interesting because I was 16, I think, at the time, and my parents were dead set against martial arts. They would not let me do it. For about two years, I wanted to do it. Uh, there was a judo group. Uh, I think it was John Dyer that was running a judo group at the Y, and uh, I watched it, wanted to be part of it. My mother was diehard against it, and then uh, that, so that fall, I met David, and I kind of snuck it from my parents. Um, <laughs> I uh, went and trained with him two to three days a week after school and uh, raised my own money to pay for my own classes for about oh, six to nine months. And I washed my own uniform. I did everything so my mother wouldn't know about it. And uh, one day I come home from school. This is the spring. And uh, my uniform's all pressed, on, sitting on the kitchen table. And my mother wanted to know what was up. <laughs> so it was quite interesting. I had to explain how I got started in the martial arts. Uh, coming home with fat lips and some black eyes here and there. Because the old days, we played a little bit harder, I think. Uh, and 
you trained with all adults versus training with, with kids or people your own age. So uh, that's how I got started in the martial arts uh, back then. And like, again, it was still uh, it was still considered somewhat of a thug art. Um, people, you know, didn't do it unless you're an adult. The kid population was very, very small, very minimal. And uh, uh, my mother found out about it because she noticed that my, my school grades were actually getting better, which I was struggling in school and high school. And, uh, and uh, my grades were getting better. My mom's a school teacher, so she, she was always, if you don't, your grades don't look good, you're not, you, you're not going anywhere. And I knew that. So uh, lo and behold, my grades are getting better and better and better. And, <laughs> and then she found my uniform in my room, I hidden and uh i had to explain it <laughs> she was actually pretty happy about it and uh that i had the gumption to go out and do it on my own so and uh so for my birthday that may she paid for uh uh a year's worth of martial arts and uh and that's how i that's how i started um in the how did how did that conversation go you know you come home and there's your gi on the table and you know, obviously she's, she wants to know what's up, you know, she's got an idea of what's going on. She's probably, probably recognizes what the uniform represents. Oh, absolutely. But <laughs> how did that conversation go? Because it, you know, clearly if she's paying for, for your lessons on the other side of it, the conversation went well, but what did, what did it look like? Uh, it, it went very well. Um, my mom was, I mean, she, we were, I went to a parochial school all the way up until eighth grade. So, I mean, we were pretty straightforward with each other um, in regards to, you know, doing stuff. My mom was also a teacher there. So um, she, she recognized that stuff real quickly. And, um, and she's, she's basically said, I know you're doing better. I see that you're doing better. When did you start doing the martial arts? And I gave her the date and, or an idea of the date. And, and that's when she's like, well, that's when we started noticing your grades getting better. Because my freshman year wasn't that great. My sophomore year got a whole lot better right off the bat. And I think that was contributed to, um, uh, like I said, I mean, my martial arts, I had to, I had to have good grades. And she's, she was upset that I lied to her. <laughs> Very upset about that. Um, cause she, she really didn't want me to getting hurt. I mean, that was probably the biggest thing, uh, it was injury. And she thought that martial arts, Again, back in the day, it was all about injuries and stuff like that, um, and people beating each other up and being super rough and stuff like that. So it was it was kind of scary. I mean, I I walked in because I'm like, oh, she's gonna tell me to quit, and uh, and she really didn't. She was more like, you know, just want to make sure you're safe. Where are you doing this? Because um, I wasn't at a traditional school. I was actually in someone's garage training with uh, about a dozen guys, um, all adults, which was kind of neat. Um, and then, and then she's, she's, we, we talked about, you know, schedules and work and, and, uh, uh, how, how I've been getting back and forth. And, uh, and that was pretty much, that's how the, the conversation went. So, and, uh, uh, we, we moved on from there. Uh, my mom was really understanding. I, I can't ask for that. I don't think my dad would have been quite as understanding when he found if he would when he found out the way he found out the way she found out because my dad was retired marine and <laughs> uh, he was cut from a different cloth. <laughs> so, um, but uh, he he embraced it because my mother embraced it. So, okay. and of course, you had something tangible to point at the school grades, something that was so important to your mother, I assume, to your father as well, and here they're getting better and, you know, sort of the counter to what I think a lot of people outside of the martial arts might expect here. You've got this extracurricular that is going to take away time from life. I mean, it, it can't add time to your studies, right? but it, you know, I would imagine it kept you focused, gave you some confidence and, you know, whatever else, the, the multitude of reasons that we all know that you probably talk to parents of potential students when, when they're looking at coming into your school, you know, we, we know how beneficial martial arts can be. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you figure also, like I said, back in 86, it was a different mindset. I mean, 
the, uh, the Karate Kid just came out and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was just breaking out. But it was still considered very much something that kids did not do. It was an adult thing. Um, and so breaking that genre was definitely, uh, it's definitely been, was challenging. And like I said, I was training, uh, I was the youngest guy in the room. The oldest, the youngest student was, I think, 24, 25 years old. And I was, uh, here I am, 16 years old, training with these guys. So, I mean, I got some bumps and bruises that, that because of that, but I also think it shaped me into the martial artist I am today. Did they treat you differently because you were a kid? Oh, no. Huh. Oh, no. Matter of fact, my instructor gave me a rope. <laughs> he didn't think I was going to last, so he didn't want to pay the money for a belt. <laughs> 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 so he gave me a white rope, and he says, well, you know, if, you, if you're here for two months, three months, he goes, if everything goes good, I'll give you your belt, your first belt, your white belt. <laughs> so he wasn't expecting me to last, and uh, that's quite interesting. I still talk to him once in a great while. Um, but, uh, it's, uh, it, he's, he's always, he's always been amazed at how, where I've taken it. And I, and I contribute a lot to his teaching. He was very open-minded into the different styles of martial arts. That's a great origin story. We, we, you know, I think that gives us some context to move on. And you gave us some hints. You gave us some, some anecdotes, some small stories there. Yeah. And I told you before, anybody that listens to the show knows I love the stories are my favorite part. So I'm going to pin you down and ask you, from all of your time training, I won't even do the math that that you would allow us to do, from because you told us when you started. Not everybody does that. <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite martial arts story? Wow, there are so many of them. Um, I guess in the beginning, when I tested for my purple belt, um, uh, it was literally a... If you're talking old school stories, that was one of my old school stories. I mean, again, we we, we were 12 guys that trained together. Um, I remember training at this guy's, like I said, it was a garage. And uh, it was for my purple belt. It was my, I actually tested by myself because it was a snowstorm. I was the only one willing to go to the test. And he still tested me because back then it wasn't as commercial as it is today. And, you know. We, we we still did things were probably today I wouldn't be doing just because of safety factors. But my purple belt test was amazing. Uh, we tested. He made me run outside in a snowstorm with uh, the old penny loafers on and stuff like that because I was not dressed properly because he gave me a hard time about that. Uh, sparring a couple adults that showed up for, just for they thought they were getting a regular workout. I had to spar two adults, one of them. Uh, his name was Ron Paquin. I will never forget it because we walked in. He was six two, and he's a, he was a, he worked for the uh, National Guard, and he looked like uh, and he looked like uh, uh, I don't know uh, uh, Bigfoot walking through the door. <laughs> so I was I was quite scared because I couldn't see his face because he had a big snow mask on, and and uh, it was uh, pretty hairy uh, for for my test. Um, it was three hours of just blood, sweat, and tears. And, uh, we laughed about it afterwards. That's the, that's the crazy thing. You know, all the, the stuff that he put me through and the training and, and, uh, at the end we're laughing and joking, which is, uh, I don't know people probably think we're crazy when we do stuff like that, but I think it helped made me a better person and definitely a stronger willed person, um, for that. And I mean, back that's way back it was one of the major stories that i tell a lot of my students um about um you know how about persevering and keep moving forward and and training harder and and not quit that no quit attitude so i mean and then i also have the story of the same person uh coming to my house showing up at my house um on a saturday because i gave my mother a hard time my father was out of town at the time and my father uh, wasn't around to help out, and and uh, I gave my mom a hard time, and she basically she blew me off. I said, "Okay, no problem," and uh, I pronounced not to do too much on a Saturday morning when there's stuff to be done. And uh, next thing I know, my instructor's knocking on the door, wanted to go work out, and I'm like, "Absolutely, hey mom, I'm leaving." She's like, "Yep, have fun," 
This is my senior in high school, so we, we jetted out and we had a three and a half hour workout. Um, and he didn't beat me, you know, my body didn't punch me, hit me, kick me, but we did drills and exercises and drills to the point where I could not move. And I'm lying on the floor in a ball of sweat after doing some sort of punching drill. I can't quite remember it. And he leans over me and he goes, don't let your mother call me again. And he left me at the dojo and I had to walk home. For two, I had to walk two and a half miles home. <laughs> so that made me refine what I do with my parents. <laughs> mm. And, uh, you know, he was, he was definitely an instructor that was willing to go above and beyond um, uh, what, normal, what normal instructors would do. So I, I take my hat off to him in regards to that, you know. And like I said, he shaped me to the, the martial arts that I am today, the not, the not quitting martial artist. Um, even though we, you know, we, we struggled, him and I, um, halfway through the arts, uh, I think I was a green belt and uh, I was graduating from high school and uh, he, uh, he basically up and left three months after that. And, uh, you know, to the point where I almost quit martial arts altogether because of that, because he didn't really give me too much notice that he was leaving. And not that I can stop him or want to stop him. We we're, we were a small part-time school, so he had to follow his job. And it was kind of frustrating. It was very frustrating because, like I said, you're 18, 19 years old and you want to continue doing martial arts and you've never trained with anybody else. Uh, it was kind of challenging. I had to basically uplift what you know, uplift who I am, and and go and say, okay, I got to check out other schools. And mm. and people, a lot of people don't do that anymore. They, if they're frustrated or upset with a school or a program that, that that doesn't jive with them, they quit. And uh, unfortunately, that's not what I did. I I checked out. I think four four other schools before I ended up with uh, uh, Kyoshi Brent Kreishi back um, back in 90, phew, neither 90 or 91, I can't quite remember. So, and then him and I have been uh, student instructors, friends, best of friends, um, business partners, you name it from that point on. So, and of course we've, we've had Kyoshi Kreishi on the show, you know, an absolutely entertaining man and, and someone I'm blessed to, to call a friend. You're, you're laughing at the word entertaining, aren't you? <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he may have, not, not to take anything away from his passion for martial arts and teaching martial arts, but he may have missed his calling. I, I think the guy might need a TV show. Absolutely. I, I could see him on some sort of reality-based show. <laughs> He's mellowed out over the years, though. People think he's still out out there but uh i remembered him back in the, in the early 90s and it was quite interesting to see him compete back then so uh, when you talk about your your first instructor there i mean it's clear the impact that he's had on you i mean just it's i'm gonna guess that you've modeled a lot of what you do after the way he affected you so deeply so i'm curious when when you're working with your students as you run your school, are there things you're conscious of that you took from your time with him? Uh, yeah, the to-dos and the to-don'ts. Um, the to-dos of the passion of training and, and the, the work ethic of training and not willing, to, you know, not willing to quit, even though you might have an injury. Uh, the, the passion of, you know, we, he loved to spar, he loved to fight, and he was... He was uh, very understanding of multiple styles of martial arts back then. Um, the to don'ts were some of the tactics of well, how we did things. I mean, you just can't do that nowadays. And not to mention, it's probably not you know, healthy. Some of the exercises that we did and some of the training that we did. Um, uh, it's just, it was like I said, it was a dip, different time period. Uh, today, you just can't do that with students. Um, one, they they would probably end up quitting because of how hard you, you were pushed. I mean, when you don't leave a horse dance for an hour, um, all your drills came out of your horse dance, out of your kibidach. And, uh, you know, he would have us hold, you know, rocks and throw punches with rocks in our hands and stuff that, you know, just 
it's just probably not good for younger kids to be doing. Um, or uh, they just kids would be bored with it. I mean, when you threw front punches for half a class, uh, it taught us that you know that we is perseverance of con training, continue training, and not you know worrying about learning that next new great thing. So you know your your basics. He was always big in the basics. Know your basics. So and then and then moving forward, uh, getting with with Kyoshi Brent. Um, he taught me about history and the, the understanding of kata and why we do kata and 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 getting into competition. Um, that really that really pushed me forward to the next step was that uh, um, the ability to start learning the history of the martial arts and why we did things and who did what and who did where. And uh, he he started opening our eyes up to um, doing different seminars. Uh, I won't forget it. For one of the first seminars I went to was with, I think it was 93 or 94 at the Karate College down in uh, Radford, Virginia. And it was Michael D. Pasquale's um, uh, college with uh, um, Superfoot Wallace and and Joe Lewis and Jerry Beasley and a bunch of other great martial artists. But those are the yeah. guys that put it on. And uh, to walk in a room, you thinking from Maine that you're this big shot, and you're not. You're not that big shot. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> you know, meeting guys like Joe Lewis was, you know, it was absolutely phenomenal. And then him remembering you, you know, uh, it made you feel really good about your your training. Re remembering you? What do you? What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, I I trained with him for two or three years down in, back in ninety three, ninety four, ninety five at different seminars. And it was probably hmm, eight or nine years uh, until I think uh, Terry Dow's event, uh, or just before Terry Dow's event, the, the symposium. And uh, I ran into him at a seminar uh, that Terry was holding on, holding. And uh, he remembered who I was. <laughs> you know, he didn't remember my name, but wow. he was. I remember you from the, you know, Radford, Virginia. And he was. It was just. I was amazed. I was blown out of the water. So, you know, you know, and it, that, 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 that's, that's life. That's priceless right there. Absolutely. To know that someone that you hold in such high regard yeah. kept enough space in their mind to remember, to recognize you. Oh, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's powerful. Yeah. I mean, I mean, people have a hard time understanding why we're willing to give up a bunch of weekends and extra hours to train. Um, it's a, it's a brethren. I mean, these guys, I mean, they, they, they'll do so much for you if you ask. Uh, and I don't think there's one martial artist out there that they're a good friend of mine that if I ever needed, needed them, that they wouldn't be there to help you out. And that's, that's, uh, and that's priceless in itself. You know, um, you, you mean dealing with family situations or issues and also having, uh, uh, you know, technology now, has made things so much easier. I mean, look at us today. We're sitting here. You're in Vermont. I'm in Maine, and we're having a great conversation. That's right. That's right. And we get to record it, and share it with others. The the kind of stuff that we couldn't do, you know, back when you and I first met each other. Yeah. Back in the the eighties, the nineties. Yeah, it was a different time. I mean, you had to travel. You couldn't pick up a, a YouTube video. I mean, I remember the Panther videos. That was probably the nearest closest thing to VHS videos that you could purchase but they they really didn't show you a ton on those videos you know it still made you had to go out there and train i mean nowadays you can pull up a video you can skype with someone you can video chat uh you name it it's it's amazing um it's made the the world a whole lot smaller in regards to training where before we had to drive 16 hours to go to radford virginia <laughs> in a van <laughs> <laughs> five smelly guys that was fun oh well i'm glad i wasn't in that van especially on the way back yeah well remember how fun kyoshi krishi is when he's <laughs> yes <laughs> time with no sleep <laughs> oh i i you know i don't i don't i don't know i don't really want to do that it was fun maybe <laughs> maybe when i was younger <laughs> yeah we, we we've shared a few quite a few stories and as a matter of fact i mean it was Brent that introduced me to a lot of these different instructors, you know, like Bill Wallace and Michael D. 
and, uh, and my current instructor, Hanji Bruce Chatnik. So, I mean, I, I got to take my, my hat off to Brent. Brent and I, have, we've uh, turned some dirt together. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, I remember being at seminars and he's uh, being at a seminar, excuse me, being at tournaments. And uh, he's the only one in the background cheering. <laughs> and vice versa, when he was competing, I was the only one in the background cheering. Because you're at tournaments that were the only two from Maine and you're down in Rhode Island or New York or or Vermont, places where, you know, at that time, a lot of Maine people didn't travel to. Yeah. So it uh, it was quite interesting. (laughs) So. You've spoken highly of quite a few people here. I mean, four past guests on the show. And of course, of course, folks, if you're new to the show, we have uh, an entire website set up with all these episodes and you can find the show notes, these other episodes that we're talking about. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is where you'll find that. Everything's free. Absolutely. I actually, uh, when you contacted me, I actually, I broke into the archive a little bit to, to kind of hone some of my skills here. But uh, <laughs> uh, also, it was always so interesting to listen to. The, the one that stood out to me was the one I actually got to sit in on was the, the Bill Wallace, uh, Bruce Chutnick interview. That was that was amazing. I wish he he had a few more hours to to interview. Right. <laughs> so uh, that's that was uh, really impressive. And uh, and listening to I actually listened to Brent's and I listened to a few others. But there, it's, that's uh, that's cherish. I mean, people need to be listening to those stuff. I'm, I was I when I yeah. first came up through the martial arts, I wasn't big into history and knowing your history. And knowing your past and knowing some, you know, what these great instructors did. And uh, I'm glad that people like Hanchi Chucknick and, and Brent, uh, Brent Creasy pushed me to those to, to have a better understanding of my history and my past. Yeah, absolutely. It's important stuff. And, and I'm just blessed that I get to be someone involved in chronicling this. Absolutely. I mean, you're narrating and you're, you're, pulling questions out of people that, uh, th- that their students need to hear and other people need to hear. I mean, that uh, it's important. These guys don't, I mean, mm-hmm. it, you know, I want to live to be 200 years old, you know, and how I do that is by uh, people remembering who I was. So, mm-hmm. you know, and that's, that's important. <laughs> so, you know, I want to be, I want people to still speak of me, you know, long long uh long past me so and uh and that's it, it and doing what you're doing is it, that's 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 gonna help that's gonna help a lot so i appreciate well, thank that you. thank you i i appreciate your your words that means a lot you've spoken so highly of so many different people and i'm I'm wondering if there's somebody that you could kind of add into the list of people that you've trained with someone you haven't and we'll we'll Pretend we have a time machine. You know, this could be somebody from anywhere. Who would you want to train with? <clears throat> wow, that's a that's a really good question. Um, someone I want to train with is so there's so many great names. I mean, um, I still have yet to uh, be able to uh, uh, meet. Is two two people that are still phenoms phenoms in the martial arts. Um, uh, Benny the Jet Ikides is one of my uh, he's one of my guys. I actually I patent my jump spin kick when I fought after him. I watched video after video after video of him him fighting and his history of fighting, sparring, and competing was amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, if people want to read some really good history, read up on him. The other one that's still alive that I, I've I've missed um, is a couple of seminars I was supposed to go to, wasn't able to travel. Was uh, Danny and Danny and Sando, um, Bruce Lee's top guy. Um, those two, if I ever have the opportunity to put it together, I would definitely be working with them. Um, those who have passed, I would say I would really have liked to have met uh, Robert Trias. I think Trias was. Um, a person that uh, embodied um, all styles of martial arts and he was beloved by all and feared by many. <laughs> mm. 
Uh, mm. He was a he was a very powerful, powerful man, and I think that's one of the guys that I definitely would have loved to have met, and I wasn't able to do so. Um, but uh, yeah, I think Trias would definitely be one of them. Uh, I, you know, I go to the gathering every year, and there's a there's a wall. It's called the Wall of Legends that Bruce Chucknick puts together, and there's probably a hundred and fifty names on that wall, and Every year you take a glance at it and there, there are people on there that I would love to have met. Um, another great person that I would love to have met is uh, Henry Okazaki. Um, uh, I actually trained with his daughter, Emi Okazaki, uh, back in the early or mid 90s to late, uh, late uh, 2003, 2004, before she passed away. And uh, uh, she was absolutely amazing in talking about her dad and reading the stories that I read about uh, Henry Okazaki sensei, uh, he was another gentleman that I would love to have met. I mean, he, he, you know, he healed himself from tuberculosis to he did massage on President uh, uh, Roosevelt. Um, he, I mean, he, just, he, he was he was a another one that was commanded respect in Hawaii that and he, he was a kind of a gatekeeper in Hawaii, who, a lot of different styles of martial arts came through him. Um, the, the Kodokan system of judo came through him, but he studied and understood Filipino arts to uh, Korean, Chinese arts, you name it. He was very open-minded um, compared to the styles of, uh, of Danzaru right now. Is uh, I hate to say it, they're not as open-minded as they were, as he was, I don't think. Um, and And that's too bad. Uh, Why do you think that happens? That's a subject that comes up on the show, and we don't get into it terribly often. But uh, well, you know, where do you think that comes from? I don't know. It, that's a, it's a really good question. Uh, is it fear? Um, fear that they're going to lose their style? Uh, I mean, it's, you see it. You see that somewhat in in a lot of the smaller schools. They're, you know, my student can't go here. You know, because of fear of losing that student. Versus, they don't realize that. You know, having an open door policy makes your student that much better, um, I guess. I mean, I believe that, I, I mean, I take my students everywhere to seminars whenever I get a chance that someone wants to come with me to train and do a do a seminar here and there, I'll take them. Um, because I think an open door policy with that, it makes my students stronger, better, um, uh, willing to learn. They see the similarities and styles of different arts. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, I, 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 I'd almost contribute to being fearful of losing something or losing the, maybe the essence of the martial arts. Um, as long as you're not bastardizing it or, or trying to ruin a style that's, you know, of history, I don't think that should be, should be an issue. So, so yeah, I mean, that, that's a very touchy subject because a lot of people don't like to talk about it because they're afraid they're going to hurt somebody's feelings or, or they're gonna they're gonna blackball themselves, and I don't think, I think you know more people need to be willing to to be open minded with regards to that. And he was mm. Okazaki was very open minded. Um, I have a book that was signed by his daughter that he wrote. Um, you know, it was a women's self defense book that was written in nineteen twenty six twenty seven. You know, something that was unheard of. You know, you know men teaching women how to defend themselves. You know, it was just it was kind of, it was it was unheard of, and he wrote a book on it, and he was he was an innovator of in martial arts, and uh, it was interesting. I mean, he has, uh, I mean, one of his top guys, Professor Wally J. I mean, there's a bunch of them. Um, I met Tom Balls, who was a student of um, Sid Kufraf. Um So yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of them out there that that came from Okazaki's trainings. So yeah. Cool. I'm curious that book, that book from the twenties, does it hold up? Does the lessons on women's self-defense apply today? Absolutely. I mean, they're simplistic. I mean, they're simplistic uh, uh, self-defense techniques. And you know, when you're teaching women's self-defense, that some to, to someone that's not training um, on a consistent level, the, those techniques definitely hold up. They hold uh, huge merit um, because of because the, you you don't create. When someone's doing just a self-defense class, they don't have that muscle memory that we do as a martial artist that we that you kind of need to have if you're going to be doing some of these intricate techniques and skills. 
Um, you got to have that. You got to build up that muscle memory. You're just not going to remember it. You know, if I teach a uh, women's self defense course, I always revert back to that book of simple is better. And uh, because unless they're doing it on a regular basis, they're not going to remember it. And that's our, uh, you know, it's unfortunately it's our, uh, I don't know how to say it, uh, you know, our demons when regards to martial arts. We want to teach, you know, these amazing techniques and skills. But when you're teaching someone that's only going to do it maybe once or twice, you know, you got to keep it simple. You know, the old, the old kiss method. <laughs> Very appropriate acronym. Yep. I'm sure that throughout life you've had, you know, hopefully far more good than bad, but I want to talk about the bad for a minute. Those points in time, whether it's a day, a week, a moment where things weren't going well. I'd like you to tell us about one of those times and how you were able to use your martial arts, whether that be the physical aspects or the mental part to move through that challenge. Wow. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I mean, as a martial arts instructor and student, I mean, I'm, you've probably come up with a half dozen areas that you were, that you, you know, that challenged you to do this, challenged you to do that. Um, I have one that probably was my biggest challenge is when my son and daughter was born. Um, um, they were born two months early. And um, my daughter, well, they were both in a NIC unit for quite a while. Um, but the first, the first two weeks of my daughter's life, she was touch and go to the point where um, she had to have a couple surgeries to, um, we weren't sure. I mean, we gave her last rites. Um, there's a lot of things that went on with my daughter, um, that if I didn't have a, uh, my martial arts as, uh, to, to help me with being strong, um, but also be my martial arts family. Um, uh, both of those were they, they saved my life because I couldn't just end up I couldn't just close my facility for two months and then expect to reopen it, especially a full time facility in Winthrop, Maine, where populations are really small and all it takes is a little bit slip with a um, a little slip and you you're probably going to end up closing your your school because of it. So that 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 time period was extremely challenging for me. Um, uh, Marshally, as uh, I mean, you, you had to still have, keep your strength, your energy. I was still teaching classes, um, um, and being able to walk on the mat. And uh, I remember my instructor saying that you got to leave, you got to leave your woes and worries in your shoes, you know. And I would remember always taking my shoes off at the entry of the, the classroom, and it was like a switch was flipped. Here it is, my daughter's in a, a hospital and I'm teaching a martial arts class. And I know some people would probably think that, you know, why is he doing that? You should be with your, your child. Um, I, had, I still had people that were, I had to be responsible for. And uh, um, that's where I still get on the mat, forget what was going on and just focus on teaching my classes for two to three hours. And that kept me sane. And the minute I got done my classes, this is where my martial arts family would kick in. I would jump in my vehicle at nine o'clock at night, drive to Portland, which was about an hour and 15 minute drive. And when I, thankfully for cell phones, I jump in my car, I would contact, I had uh, four, three or four friends that, that I'd call. They were in the martial arts and every one of them were martial arts instructors or students. And I would call them and, and we'd rap for an hour. And then the, the this person on the other end of the line would know that I was safe in Portland. He's all right, sounds like you're parking. I'll talk to you tomorrow. And uh, I would get out of my vehicle, go upstairs and, and visit with my daughter or, and my son. Um, my son wasn't as bad, but visit with them. And for two to three hours, uh, uh, go over where we were sleeping or staying sleep for four or five hours, get up in the morning and go back to the hospital. Um, so then that's where your martial arts strength has to kick in. Um, 
your endurance. Uh, and that's what I kept on. I used to relate to people. I said, your endurance kicked in so much here. It had to, because if not, I, 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 I would have been in a basket case. I mean, we did that for two months, back and forth, back and forth for two months. And, uh, that really made me, a uh, um, uh, a better martial artist, I think, um, because of that, because it, it made me respect my family, um, uh, my martial family, and also, uh, really honed in your, your, your mind, body, and spirit of the martial arts. Because if I didn't have that, I, I probably would have lost it. Um, I, 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 I would have had a nervous breakdown because of it. Um, but, uh, mm. it kept me, it kept me straight. Powerful stuff. Certainly a situation that no one ever wants to go through. No. But it sounds like, I mean, you, you, you said that there were some positives. This, this has made you better. It was a way for you in a, sort of a martial arts adjacent way to build on your martial arts. Yeah. We talk so often about training and why we're training, and it's so easy to look at a physical confrontation as being the only time that we test our skills. But here's a very concrete example of how your willpower, your physical endurance, your dedication, the word you've used today quite often is perseverance, how those skills tempered in the dojo allowed you to be there for your family. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, you're, uh, I call it the selfishness, your self-awareness, your self-control, your self-esteem, self-respect, your your self-discipline and your self-defense if you don't have those you're you know you're not you're not a true martial artist i don't feel um you know it's nothing wrong with being selfish (laughs) and uh it made me it it it, like i said it saved my life i'm sure during that time period because there were times where you know i'm working on two three hours of sleep uh and still teaching classes still um I won't forget to because they were born April first. Um, uh, at the time, I was I I had a plowing company as well, and I think two weeks after my kids were born, we had a big huge snowstorm, and I went almost I was probably fifty four hours without sleep because I had to work. I still wanted to see my children. I had to work. I had to plow. It was crazy, and uh, I I I like I said I think my martial arts. It, it's just amazing. It's, I think it kicked in. It was like automatic. Your body just kicked into automatic mode and you just did what you had to do. And, and, uh, and, uh, uh my, my, it, I didn't have to think about it. I don't need, I don't think I even thought about it once that, you know, that, uh, I could not do it I, the whole time as I can, I can get this done. You know, that, that mentality, uh, uh, testing for your black belt, you're in the middle of your black belt test. And, you know, there's points where you sometimes have that self doubt and then all of a sudden it just, it washes over you of, I can do this and no one's going to stop me from doing this. So, and, uh, I related to that too. We've heard today that martial arts is you. I mean, clearly if you're going to give up so much of your time to do something, it, it, it's core to who you are. But I'm curious, are there things outside of your, your family, outside of martial arts that you're passionate about? Any hobbies? Um, definitely family. Uh, I, you know, during the winter, I, I snowmobile. I used to snowmobile a lot. I actually uh, had an opportunity to be part of a, a team, main racing team. I just wasn't able to take the time away from running a school and being able to put as much time or effort into that. So um, I, I think I would have been a pretty good teammate because of of my conditioning and ability to that don't quit um mentality and some of the training Mm -hmm. and some of the races that we had you had to have that don't quit mentality so it was uh um it was pretty interesting on that aspect as well nice how about martial arts movies do you enjoy them Uh, yeah i'm 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 guessing you you know you and i came up at the same time and it was kind of this this resurgence, this golden era in the in the eighties, early nineties. We were getting some decent films again. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, what the, the the Steven Seagal movies to um, you name it. Um, 
the the Van Dam movies. Definitely Bruce Lee. I mean, I don't know. Did you grow up on the the Kung Fu Spaghetti Westerns? Saturday morning. I didn't. I didn't. No, we didn't. I don't know if they just weren't on the channels we had, or or if I just wasn't aware of them. But no, I didn't find those until later. Yeah, those. I actually we got into those quite a bit. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, there were always some amazing movies. Uh, I, I'm a I'm still a big Jackie Chan fan. Um, uh, love him. Uh, uh, Jet Li, like him as well. I mean, there's uh, there's so many good martial, talented martial artists out there, um, especially in the movies. Um, uh, Jason Stratham, another great martial artist. Um, so I mean, yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm I don't keep I haven't been keeping up on the movies as such <laughs> because there's so many of them out there that keep turn getting That's turned tough. out there. Awesome. How about books? You're a student of history, and Hanchi Jutnik is the man that you call your instructor now. Of course, anyone who's listened to that episode knows that that was a, a, a lengthy episode that can be summed up as know your history, something that <laughs> is so clearly important to him. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if, if you came by that naturally or perhaps he beat it into you, but um, a lot of the older stuff, you, you mentioned a couple books already. Yeah. Um, a lot of it, it's tough because I mean he definitely it, he made me understand martial history and history period. Um, I had my mother that and father of both school teachers, so um, uh, you know science and history were big. I mean one of our I remember one of our vacations was to go to Washington D.C. and learn about all of uh, what Washington D.C. had to to offer and do it again. You know, just to learn the history of the of where, what we are, who we are, um, and then the reinsurgence of uh, Hanchi Chucknick of um, getting us to 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 know our history. Um, we did a I, I'll never forget this. We did a we call it Deshi, which is basically we stayed at his house. It was I think uh, eight or ten of us. We literally stayed at his house for four days. We get up early in the morning, around we get going around seven seven thirty, and we train until four or five o'clock in the afternoon. And then he gave us homework at night um, for three nights. We did that for three days. And uh, I won't forget it, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And um, one of the homework assignments, he gave us this big book, a big binder with all this uh, history in it, was um, knowing your leaders, um, right? good leaders and bad leaders. So we had to do uh, a little mini report and create our own I don't know, country, let's say, for easier words. So we had to pick a president, a general, and um, someone like Aristotle's or Apocrates, stuff like that, that that um, that was more of your spiritual guidance of a person. And we had to be able to create our, our organization based upon who we did our, our studies on and why it would be successful, you know, you know like, why is the United States successful? Why was Alexander the Great successful? Stuff like that. And uh, he was, he's huge into that. Um, mm -hmm. I remember going to train with him at Gettysburg and training there um, on the battlefield. And we talked about history and, and battle, uh, different battle scenes and stuff like that. And he then related it to martial arts, which was amazing. It was like, it made martial arts kind of come alive uh, in a different aspect, in a different way which a lot of people wasn't able, you know, not able to do. And he tied it in so amazingly. It was awesome. Um, so with that being said, books, um, I was always a Jack London fan, uh, White Fang, Call of the Wild, stuff like that, those type of books. But uh, I've always been big into history. Um, I love, uh, I, I do a lot of reading on Teddy Roosevelt. Um, he's probably one of the best uh, I read some really good books on him. Um, not to mention he, he grew up in Maine. So it's kind of cool. Not a lot of people know that. <laughs> um, I don't think I knew that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm racking my brain. I don't think I knew that. Yeah. When he was young, he, uh, he was, uh, I want to say he had emphysema or, or something like that. It was, a, it was, uh, regards to breathing and, and, uh, and his parents sent him to Smyrna Mills, Maine. To live in a, 
uh, a logging and hunting camp and to, to, just to help strengthen his lungs and stuff like that. There's, uh, there's, he has journals about climbing Mount Katahdin and, and hunting oh, and wow. fishing in Maine. And that's what gave him his, uh, his uh, oomph to be wanting to be uh, 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 more eco-friendly. I, I, that's probably the best way to say it. But uh, uh, he was the ones that started a lot of the national parks and the different organizations for uh, the preservations of, you know, animals and stuff like that in the United States. Right. And of course, he was known for playing judo yep. in the White House. Exactly. That, I was just going to get to that. He was, he was the only, and that's the other thing I, I say, hey, that's what made him cool is he's the only martial artist of all our presidents that studied martial arts in the White House. So, and uh, he was, he was big into it. He loved it. So, yeah. Um, and, and then his, his famous quote of, you know, walk softly and carry a big stick. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a good quote for all martial artists. <laughs> totally. So what's keeping you going? You know, your, your training, you sound like you're still as, as passionate about your training and your school as ever. And I'm always curious why it, you know, most of us, we don't do so well when we have these open-ended commitments things, you know, most of us can, can buckle down and get something done for a fixed period of time, but you've invested so much of who you are into this kind of esoteric idea of the martial arts for the majority of your life. Why? What's, what's keeping that drive? Um, to be a student. Uh, I, phew, I tell people that it says, you got to continue being a student. And if you don't, you stop being a student, you will not be in the profession um, for a very long time. You'll, you'll literally, you'll, I've seen, I've seen it. I've seen a lot of these great martial arts instructors that bowed out because they stopped being students. Um, two years ago, I started studying another style of martial arts, uh, Daituru under, uh, Roy Goldberg sensei. Um, a friend of mine, Tony Desario got me interested in this and I'm like, I gotta learn this. I gotta, I, I gotta be a student again. Um, I've studied many different styles of martial arts um have rank in a lot but i i want to be a student again and this gave me the opportunity to do so uh keep my energy going uh keep that passion alive i think a lot of people lose that passion because they uh they stop being a student they they want to be just that business person or that just i just want to run a school and you'll burn out um i watch guys like a good friend of mine dave kovar uh, uh, he is amazing at keeping his energy alive. Um, that guy, I, 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 I'm amazed at how he keeps, keeps things going all the time. He's on screech a hundred percent. But one of the things that, you know, I had sat down lunch with him when he came to Maine one time and he said to me, he's like, Ryan, I just got to continue being a student. He goes, that's the reason why I do what I do. And I can do what I do is because I want to be a student. And uh, he's extremely successful in the martial arts. Um, a lot of people look up to him on how to run their schools and how to become better people in the martial arts um, and how to be a better instructor. So hmm. yeah. He is an incredible example of someone who has <clears throat> dedicated themselves to lifelong learning. If I remember correctly, 10 black belts, not honorary, but legitimate, trained for, earned yeah, Black belts. absolutely. And you know who, who his instructor was, right? Um, his, his original instructor. You're thinking of somebody in particular. No, his original instructor. I, I'm, I'm going to kick myself, <laughs> but because I know this, it's in there somewhere. But yep. go ahead. Uh, his original instructor was Bruce Chutnik. So I did know that. That's right. Yeah, I mean, um, if you read David's one of his David's books, he talks about. Um, I think it's the, it's the Toolbox book. He uh, talks about. Hanchi, um, about, you know, the do's and the don'ts of an instructor. And, and uh, uh, you know, Hanchi, you know, Chuck Nick basically introduced him to multiple styles of martial arts. You know, it was amazing. I mean, the Filipino arts to, um, uh, you know, Parker Kempo to, uh, Tracy Kempo, excuse me, not Parker, Tracy Kempo to White Crane, um, you name it. There's a bunch of styles of Silat Kuntao. He studied with uh, 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 Jutnik Sensei, uh, and then and then from there it gave David the bug to go out and study and 
multiple other styles of martial arts. Um, he's a super well-rounded person because of that. Um, not to say you can't stay with one style of martial arts. Um, you can. I know many of uh, many great instructors stayed with one style of martial arts as long as they had that passion of being able to be continuously the student. That's what made them successful in it, I think. That's my, I guess, my opinion of it. <laughs> I, I think it's a good one, and it's certainly an idea that we've heard echoed on the show quite a few times. It's important, and yet, as important as it is, as much as we've heard it, it's not something that I think everyone is willing to do. No. Maybe we, maybe this episode will convince a few more to... <laughs> To do it, I mean, it, stretch. I know I I did it. I mean, I uh, I own my own school, my own building, and I remember we were doing an expansion on my facility, and I was one of the guys pounding nails and teaching classes, and uh, I stopped becoming a student, and my classes faltered for it, and I'm like, wow, that that's amazing, you know, six months of me not putting my effort where it should have been. And I can already see my classes start to falter because of it. And uh, that's one of the reasons why, it's one of the areas when I said I need to get back into being a student. And that was two years ago. Um, I, I jumped back into doing a completely different style of martial arts. So it's, uh, it, it pushed me. So I, and I, yeah. I'm, I'm thankful for it. And I was thankful that I recognized it before things could have gone bad. How can people reach you? You know, I know that you, you travel around a bit. If someone wants to reach out and connect, maybe invite you to their school or something like that, how would they get a hold of you? Well, uh, I, there's a couple different places to get a hold of me. I, uh, I, I've been moved into the 21st century on Facebook. So I'm on, uh, on Facebook, uh, Ryan Chamberlain, really simple, easy way. Or you can look up my facility, uh, United Fitness. And we have a self-group, United Fitness and Friends, uh, on Facebook. Um, if you just want to contact me directly, you can call me at the Winthrop location. And if I'm not traveling, I'm pretty much, uh, one of three people are going to answer the phone. Um, so I, it, uh, you call Winthrop United Fitness. I will answer that phone if it's during the week, weekends, uh, I'm, I'm hit or miss because I do travel and I've been doing a lot more seminars lately. Uh, I tra travel f with Hanji Chutnik and, uh, and I actually go I still go, I try to go to two or three seminars every year uh, to different instructors just to, to, to see other people teach. Um, and uh, I think people like uh, Brent and uh, his instructor, Master Ho, for that because it's, you know, they're still on the floor. I, you know, I watch, you know, Master Ho, um, 70 years old, and he's still out there training. He doesn't have to. He can go on his accolades if he wanted to. Um, but uh, he's still out there training. So if he can do it, I can still do it. Nice. And my last request, some parting words for everyone listening today. Right. What, what advice would you leave them with? What advice? Wow, that's... Jeremy, you're doing a great job at this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, Thank you. I guess the, I guess the biggest one is... is if you are in the martial arts and you've been in the martial arts for a long period of time, um, don't be afraid to put on that white belt again. Um, and uh, don't be afraid to, 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 I don't want to say embarrass yourself, but get out there and have fun, you know, laugh, joke, um, and, you know, make mistakes. You know, students like to see that you're human too. Um, that's probably one of my, my first instructor's flaws is he, he, he hated, seeing people make him making mistakes. Um, I think it made me a better instructor. Also made my students better because they, if they see me making mistakes, they know it's okay um, to, to, you know, uh, I guess the best saying is a mistake is a learning opportunity. So if you're making mistakes, you're, you're trying to learn, you're trying to better yourself. Um, and then, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to great martial artists. You know, um, my goal is to reach out to different martial artists as I continue my training. I'm going to get out there and I'll reach out and talk to, to some new people. My goal is this year is to either met, meet uh, Benny the Jet or to meet uh, Guru, Guru and Santos. Um, those are my two goals this year. I try to set something up. I'm going to, I will get it done because I feel that 
you know, to your continued education is going to just make you a better martial artist. Sheehan Chamberlain is nothing if not a dedicated martial artist. His passion, his genuine love for the arts, it's awesome. I really like his attitude towards both training and teaching, and it's probably why we're friends. Sheehan Chamberlain, thank you for being on the show today. If you want to check out the show notes, you can find them at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, and you can find all of our products at whistlekick.com. If you want to follow us on social media, give some feedback, or just say hello, you can do that. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, we're at Whistlekick. You can always email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com, and I hope you do because I love to get feedback from listeners. That's all for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, have a great day.